Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Mohammed Nishanti Zada. I'm a neurologist and movement disorder specialist at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. And to, this afternoon, I'm going to actually be going over three lectures that I hope will comprehensively review movement disorders. So let's jump right in. This first talk is going to be an overview of movement disorders, and then I'm going to focus more on Parkinsonism. When you think about movement disorders, sometimes the uh, the edge of movement disorders seems a little blurry because um, there are many types of movements that can happen in the body. And so one definition is that these are uh, involuntary or abnormal movements that are not due to seizure activity. And as you can see, that's sort of a blurry definition because there are definitely people who have dystonia or myoclonus in the setting of epilepsy. And gradually, movement disorders is blending in and overlapping with some of those higher level cortical disorders as well. Usually, when people have movement disorders, we think of problems subcortically in the brain involving the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the brain stem. Uh, but spinal cord and peripheral nerves uh, and other peripheral aspects of the nervous system that can also be involved uh, depending on what type of multiple system disorder is present. But I'm going to cover uh, all of these different movement disorders today. So I promised we would start with an overview of Parkinsonism. When you think about idiopathic Parkinson's disease, this usually constitutes the vast majority, 75 to 80 percent of all people who are Parkinsonian. Different numbers are presented um, one of the more common statistics is that about 1% of people over the age of 60 may develop Parkinsonism. Some people have said that that number is as high as 25 to 3%, but I think the, number, the true number is probably closer to 1. By the time people are 85 or older, more than 4% of people are thought to be Parkinsonian. The problem is that there is a balance between what's truly neurodegenerative and what is actually related to loss of dopamine from normal aging. I think one of the things that I, when I work with residents and medical students that I mention is that when you think of most people who are over 105 years old, and actually over the years, those of us who have been doing neurology for a long time, there's still really only a handful of people I've ever met that were at the very, very upper end of being extremely elderly. And the truth is, most of them are probably a little Parkinsonian, but nobody says that because they're like usually just amazed, number one, that somebody could live that long. Uh, but also, they usually have more uh, favorable things to say, like, oh, it's amazing. You know, she is 105 years old, but she still has her mind. Well, some of that is that it's very likely at that point that she has lived longer than most of the people who would develop Alzheimer's disease. So the same way that not everybody ends up on dialysis, not everybody will end up having dementia when they become extremely elderly. But with loss of dopamine, it is more likely that people will start to take smaller steps or shuffle, or at least have some significant bradykinesia, even if they don't have Parkinson's disease. So that's one of the, the key features uh, as we think of age-related change. If I told you that the average age of idiopathic Parkinson's disease patients was somewhere in the early 50s, there's a difference between somebody who three, six, nine, 12 months later may actually progress because of a neurodegenerative problem versus somebody who may have loss of dopamine very slowly over years and decades as they become more elderly. So when we talk about secondary Parkinsonism, all we're saying is that these Parkinsonian findings, which I'll elaborate more on shortly, are due to some other known cause. And we'll talk about some of those many causes. Parkinson plus syndromes usually involve degeneration of multiple systems. So this could be cortex, it could be basal ganglia, there could be other nuclei in the brainstem or cerebellum, and all these connections. And so because of this, they usually don't just present with Parkinsonism, they have other uh, deficits as well, and I'll cover some of those. And then the fourth group of Parkinsonian people 
have heredodegenerative Parkinsonism. These are ones who will likely have genetic causes or triggers. Now, part of that um, seems very categorical to separate all of these into four, when in reality, there is a lot of overlap. And in fact, most people who have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, even if it seems like it's sporadic and they have no family history of Parkinsonism, there may be genetic triggers or causes uh, that have increased their risk. So understanding the genetic causes will hopefully help us better understand why other people who don't have a specific cause of Parkinsonism develop the condition and have progression. When you think about what it means to have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, even this can be broken down into subtypes. So one of the more common types that we think of when we think of classic Parkinson's disease is tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. This is usually where people have more involvement of rigidity, rest tremor, bradykinesia, especially in the limbs. So 60% of the time, the hand that people write with is actually the limb that will be involved with rest tremor. When I was a fellow at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, there was actually a study looking at what is the first clinical or motor sign of Parkinson's disease. And the answer was actually shoulder stiffness. It wasn't until many months or even a year later, uh, sometimes a year and a half, where people would start to notice rest tremor. But it's more common in your dominant hand, 60% of the time. I wanna touch on another condition that is not um, exactly the same as idiopathic Parkinson's disease, uh, for a long time, it was thought to have some overlap, but this condition is known as benign tremulous Parkinsonism. With benign tremulous Parkinsonism, I'll never uh, forget the patient I met, uh, and he walked into my clinic room, and he sat down, and I asked him when was the very first time he had features of Parkinson's disease. This was about four or five years ago, and he said 1986. Well, even at that time, it had been 28 or 29 years. And he really, I mean, he was ambulatory. He did not need high doses of levodopa. He never developed a lot of the complications that you might see. This was a very benign course that we wouldn't normally see with somebody with Parkinson's disease. And so over time, that can help figure out some of the progression of whether this is Parkinson's disease or a more benign condition. Also under the umbrella of idiopathic Parkinson's disease is a, uh, another form called postural instability gait dysfunction or PIGD Parkinson's disease. Now, as opposed to appendicular, which is involving the limbs, there's disproportionate midline or axial involvement. And these patients, even if they do have rest tremor, which is not always present, they may have disproportionate bradykinesia and rigidity. And as you can imagine, this particular form of Parkinson's disease, even if it responds to levodopa, has a lot more mobility difficulty and their outcomes are not as good. The other thing I should mention, and there are more than two subtypes, but there are subtypes of younger patients who may have an earlier age of onset and slower disease progression. Some of these are thought to potentially have more genetic risk factors. And then there are other people who may present older who have a more rapid disease progression. And one of the reasons for this is that there may be less cognitive reserve or the ability for a younger, healthier brain to be able to make up for some of the loss of dopamine cells. And especially when you consider that most of the time, 50 or 60% of dopamine cells have to die before people start to have just the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It's actually a tribute to how much reserve most people have uh, to be able to avoid clinical features, even with that much dopamine cell death. There are other exceptions to these rules. There are certainly people who have a younger age of onset who could progress more rapidly. Um, you think of some of the juvenile Parkinsonian conditions. Um, and uh, there are people who are older, actually quite a number of people, who are labeled with Parkinson's disease but if you look carefully, they may have a lot of features of underlying essential tremor. And these are the people who would come back to clinic once a year, and they're very satisfied with how their, quote, Parkinson's medicines are working. 
I followed many of these patients for five, six, seven years, and the dose of their levodopa doesn't go up. And they're even in their mid to, late, uh, mid to late 80s sometimes. So these actually may have a very slow disease progression. And then the question then becomes, does the essential tremor unmask the effects of normal dopamine cell loss with aging? So these are some of the concepts that we think about. Well, what about other secondary causes of Parkinsonism? One of the most common that we need to be aware of is drug-induced Parkinsonism. The classic scenario is going to be people who are using dopamine antagonists. These can be phenothiazines like chlorpromazine or prochlorperazine, but there are a variety of other medications that are used for psychiatric conditions, including some of the butyrophenones, the, the thiozanthines, and the benzamides. Fortunately, some of these are older and not used as readily as they have been, but even the newer second-generation dopamine antagonists are notorious for worsening Parkinson's. Another class of medicines uh, that's, um, that has some uh, older and new uh, members are the dopamine depleters. So rather than actually blocking dopamine receptors, these actually tend to deplete dopamine from nerve endings. Uh, and some of these involve uh, VMAT2. But reserpine is a very old uh, blood pressure medicine that actually depletes dopamine. And then tetrabenazine, which was eventually, about 11 years ago, the FDA approved for Huntington's disease, uh, also works as a dopamine depleter. So as the potential side effect from tetrabenazine and some of the newer medicines like valbenazine and dutetrabenazine, which are FDA approved for um, tardive dyskinesia or Huntington's disease, depending on which medicine you're talking about, uh, all of these medicines as a side effect, if you're on too much, people can start to develop some bradykinesia and worsening Parkinson's. Methyl dopa is an old blood pressure medicine that used to be used a lot, uh, especially during pregnancy. Um, and lithium chronically uh, for either bipolar mood disorder or sometimes for certain types of chronic headaches can also, especially over long periods of time, make people more likely to develop par secondary Parkinsonism. It's not usually a scenario where somebody starts the medicine and then within a few weeks or months, they're Parkinsonian. You're actually much more likely to have um, uh, tremor, uh, postural or kinetic tremor from lithium, uh, or even neuropathy from uh, acute or subacute toxicity. Infections are not a common cause of Parkinsonism, but I mention them because there are many case reports in the literature. Uh, various viral encephalitides are known for causing Parkinsonism. In fact, the famous encephalitis lethargica that happened in the 1920s after World War I left many people institutionalized with Parkinsonism before there were any really good medication treatments. And if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, Awakenings, uh, starring Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, this told, told the story of how they actually gave some of these people who had encephalitis lethargica uh, and who were longstanding uh, in their Parkinsonism, how they gave them levodopa when it first came out in 1969, uh, and how they had some short-term uh, benefits. Various brainstem or midbrain uh, infections like a fungal abscess, a tuberculoma has been reported. Certainly prion disease like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or other prion diseases can present with Parkinsonism, although ataxia